during Arctic summer, from the 22nd to the 25th of June, at a high enough latitude and altitude, you can watch a phenomenon known as, the midnight sun, where the sun stays continuously visible in the sky for three days straight. The midnight sun, rises on the 22nd, and for the next 72 hours, never disappears from sight, slowly ascending and descending every 12 hours, showing three brilliant sunsets and sunrises, without ever actually setting below the horizon. In the Brighton Examiner of July, 1870, United States Ambassador to Norway, Mr. Campbell, described his experience, witnessing the midnight sun with a group of gentlemen, on a cliff, 1,000 feet above the Arctic Sea, at the 69th North Parallel. It was late but still sunlight. The Arctic Ocean stretched away in silent vastness at our feet, the sound of the waves scarcely reached our airy lookout. Away in the north, the huge old sun swung low along the horizon, like the slow beat of the tall clock in our grandfather's parlor corner. We all stood silently, looking at our watches. When both hands stood together at twelve midnight, the full round orb hung triumphantly above the waves, a bridge of gold running due north, spangled the water between us and him. There he shone in silent majesty, which knew no setting. We involuntarily took off our hats, no word was said. Combine the most brilliant sunrise you ever saw, and its beauties will pall before the gorgeous coloring which lit up the ocean, heaven, and mountains. In half an hour, the sun had swung up perceptibly on its feet, the colors had changed to those of morning. A fresh breeze had rippled over the florid sea, one songster after another, piped out of the grove behind us, we had slid into another day. M. Paul B. Du Chailu said, tourists from Huparanda, prefer going to Avisaksa, a hill 680 feet above the sea from which though 8 or 10 miles south of the Arctic Circle, they can see the midnight sun for three days. As the voyage drew to a close, and we approached the upper end of the Gulf of Bothnia, the twilight had disappeared, and between the setting and rising of the sun, hardly one hour elapsed. The paranda is in 65 degrees 31 minutes north latitude, and 41 miles south of the Arctic Circle. It is 1 degree 18 minutes farther north than Archangel, and in the same latitude as the most northern part of Iceland. The sun rises on the 21st of June, at 12.01 a.m., and sets at 11.37 p.m. From the 22nd to the 25th of June, the traveler may enjoy the sight of the midnight sun from Avisaksa, a hill 680 feet high, and about 45 miles distant. If the Earth were actually a spinning globe, revolving around the Sun, the only place such a phenomenon, as the midnight Sun could be observed, would be at the poles. Any other vantage point from 89 degrees latitude downwards, could never, regardless of any tilt or inclination, see the Sun for 24 hours straight. To see the Sun for an entire revolution on a spinning globe at a point other than the poles, you would have to be looking through miles and miles of land and sea for part of the revolution. Anyone below the 89th parallel could never witness the Sun for 72 hours, three whole revolutions, straight because to do so would be to assume, you are somehow seeing through the globe, and to the Sun on the other side. Since such an assumption is ridiculous, and yet the midnight sun can clearly be seen as low as the 65 parallel. This is another absolute proof, that Earth is the flat, stationary, center of the universe. Thomas Winship wrote, If the Earth be a globe, at midnight, the eye would have to penetrate thousands of miles of land and water, even at 65 degrees north latitude, in order to see the sun at midnight. That the sun can be seen for days, together in the far north, during the northern summer, proves, that there is something very seriously wrong with the globular hypothesis. Besides this, how is it that the midnight sun is never seen in the south during the southern summer? Cook penetrated as far south as 71 degrees, 
Weddell in 1893 reached as far as 74 degrees, and Sir James C. Ross in 1841 and 1842 reached the 78th parallel, but I am not aware, that any of these navigators have left it on record, that the sun was seen at midnight in the south. Heliocentrists also cannot explain, why the midnight sun phenomenon is not experienced anywhere in the southern hemisphere at any time of year. Quite to the contrary, it has been recorded by the Royal Belgian Geographical Society, in Expedition Antarctique Belgique, that during the most severe part of the Antarctic winter, from 71 degrees south latitude onwards, the sun sets on May 17, and is not seen above the horizon again until July 21. This is completely at odds with the ball earth theory, but easily explained by the flat earth model. The midnight sun, is seen from high altitudes in extreme northern latitudes during Arctic summer, because the sun, at its innermost cycle, is circling tightly enough around the polar center, that it remains visible above the horizon for someone at such a vantage point. Likewise, in extreme southern latitudes during Arctic summer, the sun completely disappears from view for over two months because, there at the northern tropic, at the innermost arc of its boomerang journey, the sun is circling the northern center, too tightly to be seen from the southern circumference. Dr. Samuel Robeth M. said, It is evident, that in the great encircling oceans of the south, and the numerous islands and parts of continents, which exist beyond that part of the earth, where the sun is vertical, cannot have their days and nights, seasons, etc., precisely like those in the northern region. The north is a center, and the south is that center, radiated or thrown out to a vast oceanic circumference, terminating in circular walls of ice, which form an impenetrable frozen barrier. Hence the phenomena referred to as existing in the north, must be considerably modified in the south, for instance, the north being central, the light of the sun advancing and receding, gives long periods of alternate light and darkness at the actual center, but in the far south, the sun, even when moving in his outer path, can only throw its light to a certain distance, beyond which there must be perpetual darkness. No evidence exists of there, being long periods of light and darkness regularly alternating, as in the north. In the north, in summertime, when the sun is moving in its inner path, the light shines continually for months together over the central region, and rapidly develops numerous forms of animal and vegetable life. In typical reverse-engineered damage control fashion, trying to explain away the midnight sun problematic Arctic-Antarctic phenomena, and the fact, that Polaris can be seen approximately 23.5 degrees south of the equator, desperate heliocentrists in the late 19th century, again modified their theory, to say, the ball Earth actually tilts back 23.5 degrees on its vertical axis, thus explaining away many problems in one swoop. If it simply tilted the same direction constantly, however, this would still not explain the phenomena because after six months of supposed orbital motion around the Sun, any amount of tilt would be perfectly opposite, thus negating their alleged explanation for Arctic-Antarctic irregularities. To account for this, heliocentrists added that the Earth also wobbles, in a complex combination of patterns known as, planetary nutation, the Chandler wobble, and axial precession which, in their vivid imaginations, somehow explains away common sense. Common sense, however, says that if the heat of the sun travels 93 million miles to reach us, a small axial tilt and wobble, the difference of a few thousand miles, should be completely negligible. If the ball Earth actually spun around 93 million miles from the sun, regardless of any tilt or wobble, temperature and climate the whole world over, should be almost completely uniform. If the heat of the Sun truly traveled 93 million miles to reach Earth's equator, the extra few thousand miles to the poles, regardless of any supposed tilt or wobble, no matter how extreme, would surely be negligible in negating such intense heat. Yischini on his book wrote, The Supposition, 
that the seasons are caused by the Earth's annual motion round the Sun, at a mean distance of 92,500,000 of miles, is grotesque. According to Piazzi, the size of the Sun is in proportion to the Earth, as 329,360 to 1, the diameter exceeds that of the Earth 112 times. The Earth appears, as Biot says, by this statement, a mere grain of sand, as compared to the Sun. This enormous expanse of light focused on a rotating grain of sand, at the distance of 93 millions of miles, would cause the same season throughout it. The paltry few miles, in comparison, that separates London from Cape Town, could never cause diverse seasons, neither would the distance from London to the Riviera, justify the difference in the climate, that characterizes the two places. Common sense also says, if the Earth were actually a ball, spinning daily, with uniform speed, around the Sun, there should be exactly 12-hour days and 12-hour nights everywhere all year round, regardless of any alleged tilt or inclination, half the sphere would always be lit, the other half not. The great variety in length of days and nights, throughout the year, all over Earth, testifies to the fact, that we do not live on a spinning ball planet. There cannot exist phenomena such as this on a globe, nor the midnight sun, nor anything like Antarctic winter, where the sun is nowhere to be found for over two months per year. Gabrielle Henriette said, the theory of the rotation of the Earth, may once and for all be definitely disposed of as impracticable, by pointing out the following inadvertence. It is said that, the rotation takes 24 hours, and that its speed is uniform, in which case, necessarily, days and nights should have an identical duration of 12 hours each, all the year round. The sun should invariably rise in the morning, and set in the evening, at the same hours, with the result, that it would be the equinox every day, from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. One should stop and reflect on this, before saying, that the Earth has a movement of rotation. How does the system of gravitation account for the seasonal variations in the lengths of days and nights, if the Earth rotates at a uniform speed in 24 hours, 